welcome all of you and, and thank you all for being here, especially uh, Quentin Sten, who is the panelist for this session and has offered to help out. And so, as we said, I'm going to talk about the, the solution dynamic nuclear polarization enhanced zero to ultra low field nuclear magnetic resonance, which is the main title of is the main topic of my PhD. And although this doesn't roll off the tongue, what this means is coupling the hard preparation technique of the solution DMP to zero field NMR. I've outlined the talk in, in these four parts. So I'll first, in these two first parts, I'll make a, a brief review introduction of the field and some hard preparation that are standards at zero field. Then we have we will have some time for questions. After that, we will dive into the project itself, and then we will talk about paramagnetic realization in the context of, of this uh, project. And we can have some more time for questions as well. So, zero field NMR. Well, since this is an NMR audience, I don't think that I need to convince anyone of how great NMR is and its applications in biology, medicine, and, and chemistry. But what we can do is consider the atypical high field magnet apparatus and the, the, the fact that we need to work with superconducting magnets uh, to, to values of 10 Tesla. Uh, this requires cryogenic temperatures, which can make the setup very heavy and, and costly. But however, with the advent of, of bent stop spectrometers, um, this is starting to change. But in the following slides, I will mention uh, some other advantages that they still persist uh, at getting rid of the magnet altogether. So because of these reasons that I will present, uh, we work in a, in a, we do a strange way of NMR experiments in the absence of magnets. So this is zero field NMR, which is by no means better or or worse than high field NMR, it's just a complementary tool to it. And since, since zero field NMR is not so popular as the high field casting, I'd like to mention the difference between these two regimes. And I like to think about this if I consider a, a, a system of two couple spins, say INS, and one considers that uh, we can get the chemical structure typically in high field with a chemical shift, but there's also another uh, coupling, which is the J coupling, I would like to, to discuss about. Okay, and describes the interactions between the two couple spins with each other, mediated with the electron cl cloud between them, and also the Siemens term that describes the, the interaction of every of each individual spins to the external magnetic field. So, the situation that we have in high field is that the Lamar frequency of the individual spins or the difference of Lamar frequencies are much greater than the J coupling. And the high field, the high field spectrum, for example, if we take a proton and carbon at this field, we will get uh, the Lamar frequency of, of carbon, let's say at 100 megahertz. And then many, many megahertz later, we can find the Lamar frequency of, of proton at 100 megahertz. And we can see a splitting that is due to the J-coupling interaction in, in the orders of Hertz, typically, which does not depend on the magnetic field. And this is the, the reason why it's useful at zero field. However, in the opposite regime, in the regime that we are going to talk about today, what we have is that the J-coupling interaction is much greater than the difference of Lamar frequencies. And then the splitting of the J line directly uh, is caused by the Siemens interaction. Furthermore, we can investigate what's the residual field inside of a sample by checking the splitting value. Uh, another difference is how we want, how we can address its, its spin. So here you see that the, that the, the carbon and proton peaks are, are very are very differentiated, so we can address them by applying radio frequencies to, to the Lamar frequency for each spin. But uh, in zero field regime, 
all the strings are, are strongly coupled, so we can only apply DC composite policies to all of the, the spins together. And then another difference of these two, two regimes that John Blanchard always likes to talk about is the difference in symmetry of the apparatus. And the, the fact that at high, at high field, you have a very strong magnetic field, then you have a very clear quantization axis. And this is very well suited to study interactions. For, for example, the, the, the J interaction uh, that communes with the Hamiltonian uh, that, that is in the, in the axis of, of the quantization axis. And zero field, because we have no field, we have no quantization axis. And, and it's very well suited to study uh, um, all of the terms of, of this J Hamiltonian. Um, I would like to emphasize that contrary to high field, in zero field, imagine that we have that we are sensitive along the, the Z axis. Instead of the magnetization of each spin, what we the signal is proportional to to the to the beating of the spin I and S at the J cap in frequency. And this will play a, a big role in the results later on. This is a, a data that I found that is one of the most simplest way of, of showing uh, superspectra. Here we have formic acid, and we have two couple spins, carbon and hydrogen, that are coupled with this uh, J frequency. And at zero field, the only thing that we see is a single line at the J, J coupling. And at a higher field, at if we have a residual field inside the sample of 176 nanotesla, then we see uh, the splitting of, of this J line uh, because of the Simon interaction. Another nice advantage of zero field LMR is um, arises when one considers the, the spin depth of electromagnetic waves through, through metal. If one takes a metal reactor such as this one, and one tries to perform an NMR experience on it. Uh, if one, uh, because of, of this frequency dependence of the condition in, in, in metals, it's not possible to, to go through the metal since the depth is only in the micrometer range. However, if we go to lower frequency, and this, uh, this was done by Tudari, Pureva, James, and, and myself, and others. Uh, then the depth and length is to millimeter range, and it's, it's possible to, to observe through metal. Another advantage is that uh, we are less affected by, by um, magnetic field inhomogeneity caused by the magnetic susceptibility of the sample. So this causes uh, zero field lines to, to be very narrow with typically millihertz line width and even some millihertz uh, being demonstrated in some aromatic compounds. So now I've described the, the, the difference of the two regimes, but since at zero field there's no time varying magnetic fleets that we can, magnetic flux that we can detect with inactive pickup coils, one can ask herself or himself, how, how on earth can we take the measurement? And we do this, uh, we measure the, the, the signal coming from the molecules by using atoms in close proximity. And because we use atoms to detect magnetic field, this is rightfully called atomic magnetometer. And this works in the following way. Um, Imagine that we have an ensemble of, of alkali atoms. Here we have rubidium, but it could be cesium or potassium. And this is contained in a, in a vapor cell or in a glass box, if you will. If now we shine a, a laser light with circularly polarized light, we pump the electrons of the rubidium so that we have created a, a net magnetization pointing 
in a particular direction. If now we, we, shined, we shine another laser, typically in the transversal axis, this time not with circular, but with but we, we linearly polarize light, then in the absence of, of any signal, of any magnetic field, uh, this light passes through unchanged. The angle of the linearly polarized light has not changed and we see nothing. However, if we have uh, our sample near, nearby or any field for that matter, then uh, this field um, causes a light atom interaction in, su in su such a way that this, this linear light gets a tilt. This is called the, the magneto-optical rotation effect. And this angle of rotation depends is proportional to the magnetic field. So by doing polarimetry, by measuring the polarization of the light that goes out of the rubidium, we are able to see the signal. And this is how a, a typical SUFNMR spectrometer is. These rubidium atoms are here inside this vapor cell. Here we have a magnetic shield that can, that together with some shining coils, uh, can bring the field down to, to the sub Tesla region. And well, here we do a little trick. So it's not quite zero field at this moment, but we'll get to it, in which we pre-polarize the sample uh, at two Tesla. However, we then shadow the sample down to the zero field region, and this is where the magic happens. And, and we apply pulses with these Helmholtz coils on the sample that will create a, co a coherence, will give a signal. It will change the angle of polarization of this linear light. It will measure this, uh, this, this angle, and that's how we take the measure. This was a, a brief introduction of zero field NMR, but as Asif has said, uh, there is an excellent talk in this same seminar series by John Blanchard, a very long song, long talk, I have to add. Uh, and, I recommend that you guys check it out if you're more interested. Okay, now I will, I will make, I will give a brief uh, comments and review on techniques that have been used uh, for hyperpolarization at zero field. Well, this method of, of pre-polarizing the sample and then shooting it down to zero field uh, it's not so efficient. Uh, to give things simple, if we just con consider an, an ensemble of, of, the, of, of spin one half particles, then, and this is the, the ground state and the excited states, uh, these particles obey the Boltzmann distribution of population of states in such a way that for every million spins that are here, just one more is, is here. And this just yields uh, a polarization in the order of parts per million. So what we can do, however, is, is, uh, is, is perform hyperpolarization understood as any technique that, uh, that, that will create a higher polarization of compared to that obtained by thermal polarization at that temperature and at that field that can yield enhanced animal signals. And something that we do on the daily basis in the lab is use parahydrogen te techniques for polarization. This is called, one of them is called parahydrogen induced polarization fit. And, and this works as follows. If we take diatomic hydrogen, this can be found in nature in two isomers, uh, the power state, which is a singlet, or the orthostate, state, which is a triplet. And with this, we can, um, we can have hyperpolarization and we can measure uh, very diluted molecules that could be impossible with thermal polarization or very, or very, very long. Uh, 
we can create this parahydrogen by simply cooling down the sample. Typically, in the lab, we work at, at 30 Kelvin. And, and now this contribution of parahydrogen is more than 90%. And then in the presence of, of um, a drug catalyst, this can be released to our, system, to our system, and we can use this to perform NMR ex experiments. Here is one example reaction in which we have a precursor, which is acetylene dicarboxylate. And once we add the parahydrogen in a D2O solvent, we form fumarate, uh, which is a, an, an, an interesting molecule for, uh, for biology. It's part of the PrEP cycle. And now that we have formed fumarate with these protons hyperpolarized, then we can create a can apply a magnetic field cycle so that we we transfer the polarization from the protons to the carbon. And we have uh, done so at, at high field uh, together with James Ailes and John Blanchard, and in which we see a single shot with 25 percent precision on the carbon of a very diluted sample compared to, 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 to many averages of, of a fully labeled, very concentrated material. We have also done this at, at zero field where uh, this film rate molecule will, will yield j cap frequencies at seven hertz and then at 11 and 18, but you cannot probably see here. So this is a, a standard technique for hyperpolarization at zero field. And another technique also based on parahydrogen, this is slightly different, is SABER. That stands for signal amplification by reversible exchange. And here uh, it works in the following manner. We have an iridium catalyst that we mixed with a substrate that we want uh, to have polarized, and then we bubble parahydrogen continuously. By doing this, uh, both the parahydrogen and the substrate that we want to have polarized will reversibly bind and exchange on and off from the catalyst, and in time, the hyperpolarization of the proton will be transferred to the substrate via, via the, the GCAP network. This has the, the big advantage compared to FIB that the that the, the analyte does not change its chemical um, form. So this means that we can do this process continuously and we have the ability to average many, many scans. And this is one example in which one can use SABER at, at zero field for pyridine. Uh, again, with a, a very diluted Molecule, and in comparison, one is to do many averages uh, at thermopolarization. So the comparison with these techniques uh, uh, to polarize at zero field, well, if one considers the the put force from 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 the beginning, it has some advantages that is is completely general. You can just put a sample, any sample here, basically, and then shoot, shoot it down. Zero field is it's very simple and it's cheap. The problem is that it will yield a very low level of polarization. However, in uh, the, the parahydrogen will be also relatively simple, cheap, and can yield a very high level of, of, of polarization for, for carbon and, 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 and proton, for, for, for example. And the problem with these techniques based on parahydrogen is that they are very chemically specific. So uh, the FIB reaction only works for a handful of, of molecules. And for SABER, one needs to, uh, to, make, to make sure that the substrate can couple to the, to the catalyst. So because of this, the goal of our, of our project was to investigate a broader hyperpolarization technique for zero field NMR. And you guessed it, is the is dissolution DMP. So at the core of DMP uh, are 
the electrons. Here in this project, we work with a monoarticle called Tempo, that are the sources for free electrons. And it turns out that it's very simple to, to have polarized uh, the electron. One just needs to, uh, to put the, the sample at a high field and low temperature. And because of the high denominator ratio of, of the electrons, which is more than 600 times that of the protons, then we can get almost unity polarization on the electrons. Now we can shine microwave radiation, the radiation to the electrons, and the polarization can be transferred from the electrons to the nuclei. This is a, there are some famous DMB mechanisms by, this, by which this happens, like solid effect, and, and then with one number of electrons, you can get cross effects and thermal mixing. But here, I will just comment very briefly on solid effect in the uh, in which we have uh, a couple uh, the energy levels of an electron in a nucleus. And it will look like this. And then uh, we begin with the electrons um, at the equilibrium. And in solid effect, you can excite either a uh, forbidden zero quantum tra tra transition or the same sign of, of, of theoromatic ratios, uh, which is uh, in the frequency of the lambda frequency of the electrons plus the lambda frequency of the nuclei or a double quantum. But we can just for simplicity keep the zero quantum tra transition. Uh, by saturating this transition, we equilibrate the, the population of these energy levels. And then due to, to electric relaxation, the electron goes back, goes back to, to thermal equilibrium, but the neutron remains unchanged. And this is how we have repolarized the the nucleus. Once uh, DMP has happened, then uh, then the polarization travels from the nucleus that are nearby the electrons to the rest of the nuclei of the bulk, the spin diffusion. Um, and that's for the DMP part and for the dissolution part. Uh, is the following step. And this works by diluting the, the, the sample and warming the sample to a set temperature that can be more useful for a physiological application. And by, by doing this, at the moment of, of switching off the, the microwave fields, um, then the electrons that are close to the to the nuclei are a very big source of relaxation. So, by diluting the the, the sample, we are separating our highly polarized nuclei from those electrons, so we can reduce parametric relaxation with the dissolution step as well. So, if if we now consider the the frame of the techniques that I've described, one can ask which one is better. And well, the answer is that it depends. Uh, the solution DMP, it's a, it's a complex setup. Uh, it's very bulky, it takes the space of a room. It's expensive because it runs on a constant supply of helium and it needs to use very strong uh, microwave um, power to operate. But it has the two advantages of being much more general than the parahydrogen techniques, and we can polarize a very broad range of molecules, while also yielding high levels of polarization. So this was, again, um, a very brief introduction on DMP, but uh, you can check the, the talks in this seminar series of, of Sami Janin, 
on Israel's DMP and the DMP mechanisms uh, done by by Onu Kaushik, in which she goes into much more detail. And then now will be a time for questions if there's any. All right. So we already have a question by Walt Misevsky. So the question is, does signal averaging at zero field still follow a square root law? That's a, yeah, that's a good question. And I think the answer is yes, as long as your magnetometer is not limited by other factors. So for, 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 for instance, if, if your magnetometer is limited by, by Photoshop noise, then that will be the, the limit at which you cannot keep averaging and keep reducing the noise. So to some extent, it follows this behavior up to your other limitations. Mm -hmm. the, let's see. We don't have other question, but I have a question re regarding detection. So if suppose we have a para state, a singlet state, would we be able to detect that using this atomic magnetometer? So we have like alpha beta state mm -hmm. and such a state will not have any magnetic flux at the alkali metal center. center. So is it possible to use atomic magnetometers for such a detection? Do uh, you mean the, the alkali atoms? Yes, so you talked about atomic magnetometer using rubidium. Mm -hmm. And yeah. so that basically is, it measures the magnetic flux from your target sample nuclei. But if we have mm -hmm. a para yeah. target, would that be measurable using this atomic magnetometer? Um, I think so. If I may help, yeah, yeah. I, I think it goes down to uh, how you excite the transition. Um, so you, you won't see uh, an oscillating signal if you just have signal states, but mm -hmm. you need to create a superposition between the singlets and, and, um, and the triple state. And then you have a transient uh, or non-stationary uh, state of the system. And it goes to what Roman has explained, whether Polarization will, will jump from the alpha to the beta state and uh, first, sorry, from one nucleus to the other one. Mm -hmm. Okay. In this case, you have a transient signal. And how close the, the alkali metal has to be to the target sample? Um, well, we have done, let me go back to this. Um, I think it was slide number 10. Yeah, I can go six slides. Ah, that's better. Yeah. So for example, uh, we have performed detection um, in several ways. Here we we have the the sample right above the rubidium vapor cell. And in in this case, the distance will be around half um, a millimeter. Mm -hmm. But we have also uh, uh, have built spectrometers with a magnetometer detecting from the side, and and this the distance it, it would be a bit larger, but still in the order of millimeters. And of course, the the closer you are, the highest the higher your your, your signal will be. Okay. Yeah. So we don't have any question right now. So I guess you can proceed. Oh, there is another question. Uh, in the para hydrogen fumaric acid experiments, the product can only be used in one NMR scan. Is that right? Uh, sorry, could you repeat the question? So the question, uh, it's a comment and question. So in the para hydrogen fumaric acid experiments, the product can only be used in one NMR scan. Is oh, that yes. right? In FIP, yes. Yeah, this is correct. This is a 
a single shot experiments. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And this okay. is the distance with same. Yeah. But it, it's interesting to notice that uh, contrary to, to high field NMR, you can bubble parahydrogen continuously in, in the in the ZOLF setup without uh, having line broadening. Mm -hmm. So so it's single shot, but you can you can repeat it. Uh, you rebuild polarization and detect immediately. Okay. So I guess Roman, you can proceed with your talk. Okay. So I was here. Okay. So now now we dive into the the project uh, of of capital diffusion PP so SULF. And so what we did is we built a a portable ish, I, I would say, a pyrometer, and we put it on wheels. We try to make it as small as possible, and we took it for a for a walk from from Mainz in Germany to France, Lyon, and and here is a funny picture of the the wooden shed that we had to build in order to comply with the very harsh uh, laser safety officers there in the lab. And in here, the DMP polarizer will be at the back. And here is a nice picture that uh, Sam Janin took, which one can see a very broad range of fields in the lab from zero field to 23.5 Tesla. So that's why the number of orders of money to uh, The setup that we have built and and calibrated and characterized looks like this. On the left, we have the, the DMP polarizer. And on the, and then the transfer of the sample to, to the spectrometer. And here we have the, the zero field spectrometer. And the, pulse, the whole pulse sequence of the experiment looks like this. Now, this is a very big um, setup. So as Jack. As Jack the Reaper would say, let's go by parts. Uh, here is the first step. This is where uh, we can call it the hardware polarization step that takes about 20 minutes. And wait, I don't want to show this. Okay. And we we keep the sample at a high field and one and low low temperature about this helium crystal. And uh, we, per we irradiate the electron with, with microwaves. And after uh, we, the MP has happened, we transfer the polarization from the protons to the carbon with, with cross polarization. And we repeated this uh, this step several times while uh, monitoring the polarization of the carbons with small angle pulses uh, to to monitor the polarization buildup. After this, uh, now we have obtained some polarization for the carbon and the proton, and we invert the polarization of the carbon relative to the protons. And this is a, a very important step, and I will comment this a bit uh, later. And the, uh, oh, guys, do you know how I can hide this bar? <laughs> hmm. Well, here, here is the step. Um, here we have the, the medical wave waveguide that goes to the sample. Here we have the radio frequency channels from uh, for C the CP step and and the and the and to monitor the the precision buildup and here on blue we have the the capillary for the to inject the hot solvent for the solution. So the next step is the dissolution step, the transfer to zero field and injection. This takes a, a couple seconds, and and with this we inject hot water at 180 degrees, and we we push the the sample with helium gas 
through this magnetic tunnel of, of for millitesla through this piperacin magnet and the solenoid since we always want our, our sample to be at a magnetic field so that we don't lose any signal due to relaxation and, and, and undesired serial field crossings. And it's important to, to say that the polarization of the sample uh, follows smoothly the lines of the, the channel. And, and after this step, uh, we rapidly switch off the scanning field of 100 microtesla. And this induces co coherence in, this, in the sample. We give a, a signal, we we'll change the perception of the light, and we can detect it with a phototype. As you may have guessed, uh, this two Tesla magnet was not necessary for the dissolution DNT process, but but uh, is 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 useful to probe how su successful we were in the dissolution DNT experiment uh, by swapping the magnetic tunnel, uh, just changing a capillary, and apply vacuum, and have a very concentrated sample and shuttle the sample up and down many, many times to obtain a comparison so that we can quantify the enhancement. And this is the, well, the results. We prepared a team pictures with the, the molecules that we want to polarize. We had the temple for, uh, for the, as the source of the electrons in the conventional solvent for, for this for dissolution DNT. And we also add uh, 30 millimolar of, of sodium arscovate uh, to quench to, to quench any re residual temple concentrations at the sample that will uh, kill the, the signal. And the results are like this. And here we see uh, we have uh, used as the analyze for this first mixture a sample of formate that has a single line at J at 195 hertz and acetate, which is an AX3 group that would yield a line at, at the J frequency and two times the J frequency, so at 120 hertz and, and two times this. And we see that, the, that we are able to see single shot. And even with a higher signal to noise ratio, this molecule with, uh, with a very small con concentration of 45 millimolar, in compared to, to the thermal measurement of, of, of another format sample with a much higher concentration of five, five molar. And, and this was successful in this way. And here we, well, we still have some some noise due to the power line noise uh, from the electronics in the lab and uh, a noise due to the laser. Uh, there are some, some peaks that are, are coming from the laser. And this is the, the results of the sodium of the second mixture that we, um, we also use formate and as here with 38 millimolar and we also how to polarize uh, a biomolecule glycine that has a very low frequency. It has a J frequency of 5.3 hertz, and it's a, it's a carbon coupled to two proton. And this AX2 group will yield a single line at, at uh, three halves that value, and that is eight hertz, and this is what we see here. Okay, so now the, the now that we have obtained the results, we need to to make sense of them. So we need to, to, uh, to see how much polarization we have obtained. So in order to do this, we repeated exactly the same measurement, uh, skipping the, the inversion part. Uh, and then we remove the surface spectrometer altogether, which is simple to do since it was on, on, on wheels. And we put uh, an 
acetate sample in a in a uh, commercial bench sub spectrometer. And these are the values for the polarization of, of the proton and the carbon that uh, that was obtained by the same experiment. That's 6% and 20%. So if we want to calculate the enhancement, that will be, uh, we can define it as the, the ratio of the signal of the high polarized sample with respect to, to the same signal at the same, same sample as at thermal polarization. And as I mentioned in, in the beginning, uh, at zero field, the signal is proportional to the, to the difference of polarization for two, two couple spins, IMS. And, and this is a, a big difference uh, between zero field and high field because if one would do, um, well, here we, we, we show the, the, the color map of this formula um, with uh, cold colors going to zero and warm colors going to high, high enhancement. And if in high field one, we typically do a distribution DMP experiment and will yield, let's say, 10% polarization on the proton and 10% polarization of the carbon, then at zero field, this will be no good because if one will go to 10% of a proton and 10% on, on carbon, then we will go to this dash diagonal that will yield as a zero en enhancement. And uh, that's the reason why, because of the difference of polarization in proportional to the signal, we, we made a inverted pulse to, to uh, invert the carbon with respect to the proton. So if one considers that this, that this was done efficiently, then um, uh, these results will correspond to, to this point in this graph. 6% uh, six, six precision on carbon and minus 20% precision on Sorry, 6% 6 on proton and minus 20% on the carbon. And here we, we also added uh, what we can look up for, which is uh, we just plotted the numbers of a solid state, uh, a state of the art uh, dissolution DMP setup. And we see that uh, this work uh, puts us here. We can no longer represent this. Uh, by a, a point, since we cannot we cannot distinguish uh, the individual con contributions of proton and carbon, but just the difference. So we can represent it with a diagonal, and there's still a factor of five between what we got and what we should have got. So when we're wondering why, we believe that this uh, could be due to to paramagnetic relaxation that ironically the the same source of of polarization which is the free electrons from 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 temple can cause relaxation in the in the transfer to zero field and at the moment of of detection and this is the last part that will make very brief um could i ask as if how much time i have left you have roughly 10 minutes. Oh, 10 minutes. I only need five. That's great. Um, so we, we studied parametric relaxation by, by taking the, the effect on, on tempo on the, on the whole experiment. So we, we took a very con a very concentrated sample of of for me five 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 molar and we first perform a a, a, a typical uh, it's such a pity that I cannot not uh, hmm. this bar is a bit annoying we we don't see any on our side Roman 
Ah, really? It's just, oh, okay, so I only see this part, but not you guys, okay. So I'll just imagine that it's not there. Um, so we we have the, uh, we put a very constituted format and we performed the, the typical experiments at, uh, at zero field by keeping the, the sample uh, at the preparation field of two Tesla, and then shut up the, the sample to zero field while keeping uh, doing the transfer a field of, of 100 micro Tesla. And now we get the signal. So we can, we can study the, the effect that Temple has on the coherence on the signal by, by increasing the amount of, of Temple concentration mixed with format and see how the signal broadens. And here we see that the linear broadens uh, linearly with the, with the concentration um, value. Apart from this, we also studied the parametric realization of populations in, in fields that, are, that were relevant to our project. Um, one thing that is relevant is 100 micro Tesla because that's the, the field in which the sample stays right before detection. So we perform the same experiment as before, but this time we, uh, we, lay, we let the, the sample spend a variable amount of time at this field before rapidly switching it off. And, and detect. And this, uh, at this tau, we can make an indirect measurement uh, of the signal decay and fit it with, a, with ex, 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 exponential functions to get a, a T1 value. And this is what we repeated for several temple concentrations. And we can see that the, that the rate of T1 at, at this low field of 100 micro Tesla is also obeying a linear uh, behavior. The other field that was relevant for us was zero field itself. What happens, um, how is the relaxation at the field of detection? So for this, we repeated exactly the same, the same experiment as, uh, as the previous one that I mentioned. However, the, uh, now the difference is that we went adiabatically to zero field within 50 milliseconds. And this time is long enough so that the, the spins have time to, uh, to so the, 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 the populations of the spins have time to follow the eigenstates. And then we allow the sample to, to be as a variable amount of, of time at zero field. And then we pulse on the on the carbon, and we detect the signal. And we see that this also obeys a linear uh, behavior with increasing tempo concentration of the rate of T1 at this at, at zero field. So if T1 takes these measurements all together, one we see that the broadening of the signal due to to tempo concentration. It's about 100 millihertz per millimolar. And the relaxivity of all of these rates is 0.3 seconds to the minus one per millimolar. And what does this mean? Well, if one considers uh, the amount of tempo that we, that we would expect uh, after the dissolution, after the dilution, which is around one to two millimolar, so that would be this yellow point. Um, we, we can consider that the, that the, the samples, the sample stays uh, two, two seconds at this, this uh, is during the, the transfer field, the, the transfer time, we need to to wait for the sample to, to settle down before detection. And this takes about two seconds. 
So by, by putting uh, these values for tempo, we will see that we would have lost 70% uh, of the signal. And yeah, this study indicates that, that the, the factor five that, that we were missing in the, in the enhancement results could be uh, with something related to, uh, to parametric relaxation. But we still investigate in this. And that's, that's the end of my talk. And I would just like to finalize uh, with giving special thanks to the team in Mainz uh, at the HIM Institute, led by, by Professor Dimitri Butka, and also by, uh, to thank the team in, in Lyon, led by Sami Janin, especially Quentin Sten, who is uh, our first panelist and the main collaborator in this project. And that's all. Thanks for your attention. All right. So we have a couple of questions, both from John Blanchard. The first question is on slide number 32, why do you have, why do you have some phase inconsistency? Here? Yes. yes. Mm -hmm. that's, a, that's a good point. This is still not very clear and this could be uh, of a mismatch in the in the field of the magnetic tunnel, and yeah, this is still under investigation. Is not clear. Okay, and the second question is: um, Would you expect paramagnetic relaxation to affect heteronuclear singlet and triplet states the same? Would the paramagnetic relaxation effect be same for heteronuclear singlet and the triplet states? <clears throat> That's a tough one. <laughs> we could verify it numerically. Uh, I think it would be very, very interesting if not in a full treatment. Mm -hmm. I don't know. John raised his hand. John, let me allow him to speak. Yes, John, you can talk now. All right, more power. Um, so, but Roman, didn't, didn't you measure similar relaxation? Uh, rates in both cases? In both which cases? Uh, oh. Zero field and the Gauss. Here. Yes. And um, what does that contradict? Well, I'm, I'm just, I'm, I, I was realizing after I typed the question that I think your slides actually answered my question. <laughs> yes, but okay. here you are talking the, about the, the trip. You are talking about the triplet state at at a hundred microtesla, which pro probably not necessarily relaxing the same way as the triplet state at zero tesla. Uh, so it would be interesting to to compute it on on spin dynamica, uh, mm -hmm. because in fact the, the parametric relaxation can be modeled quite simply as a random fluctuating field. So that that could be an interesting. Uh, uh, Thing to verify to to make sense of these uh, reaxometry measurements. Yeah, because I because it looks well since you did the adiabatic transfer to zero field, you're looking at the singlet, right? That zero field. Yes, I'll be the the singlet triplet transfer. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Yeah, yeah, that could be interesting. We don't have other questions. I have Roman. a couple a couple of questions, Raman. So that is regarding BNP. So the first thing is, uh, we see there's problem of paramagnetic relaxation. And we also know in dissolution community, people have explored this optically labile systems. Have you considered those ones for your uh, studies? There are some think... optically polarizable uh, radical source. 
You mean uh, by Shannon Beauty Light? Yes. Ah. Um, I I don't know if this is something that uh, has been used in in the HMR lab. We have not used for this study, and I I think that it was going to to happen some time ago. So maybe Quentin can can comment if if some pro, some progress has happened in this field. Mm, uh, we are interested in, in this field, but uh, and we thought of implementing it implementing it in our lab, but. We are developing an alternative strategy, mm -hmm. uh, which is uh, to use uh, polymer matrices where the radical is embedded in the in, in the matrix, and we can filter it out after the solution. So, uh, which has the advantage of being uh, very broad in, in applicability. While the UV radicals, you need a, a sample which is quite specific. So we are we are pushing more in the direction of this this polymer matrices, uh, and we have a. We have, uh, we have a publication on this that will come out, come out very soon. All right. Yes, so uh, the second and the final question is, uh, since uh, this technique, it requires a difference in polarization at the high field. So have you considered, and you are using a CP experiment to transfer the polarization from proton to carbon, so have you considered mm -hmm. using a radical system where you can polarize both of them both carbon and proton, and then not do a CP. That will maximize the polarization difference. Hmm. That's, that's very interesting. I've, I've not cons considered uh, my stuff, but that's something I would like to, to think a bit more about it. You know, as, as Roman has said, we do several cross polarization steps, not only one. Mm -hmm. So we transfer, but then we repolarize, repolarize. So in the end, both the protons and the carbons reach maximal polarization. Okay. So, so even though we use this cross polarization, which is really the, one of the specialty of our team. That's why it seems quite obvious for us to use it. Uh, mm -hmm. So we use our old recipes and, and then we get good polarization on both spins. So at the very end, you don't do a CP? We do, but it's not at the very end. It's... Uh, we polarize the protons, transfer, polarize the proton, transfer. And, and it builds step by step to the carbon. And, and it doesn't, it's not because you have transferred from proton to carbon that you have killed the polarization on the mm -hmm. proton. Uh, okay. You polarize both with this technique. Okay. Yeah. 